I saw Dave Sharp. I never really got to know Dave Sharp. I, I met him and, and knew him a little bit. But I saw he and uh, um, Billy Benedict were at one festival. Dave must have been 65 or maybe a little bit more. Did a standing backflip on that stage at that age. Perfect. I mean, just, just like that. And he and Billy Benedict got into this mock fist fight, and Billy would hit him, and Dave would go over this backflip. Absolutely amazing man. Absolutely stunning. Stories about and Alan never met Alan Rocky Lane, but the stories about Alan Rocky Lane are, are legion. He was probably full of himself, but uh, as the story goes, Peggy Stewart one time on the uh, back lot was walking behind him and called him Bubble Butt. Hey, Bubble Butt, how you doing this morning? And he took offense. I mean, you know, really, he just, he had no sense of humor, apparently. It's unfortunate. He was an excellent actor. and the, There's not a bad Western that, that Rocky Lane made, but some of the directors refused to work with him because he was just hard to get along with. Yeah, Yakima Canut would refuse to work with him and met Tim McCoy. Tim McCoy who worked with uh, Bill's dad, Bobby Winkler. At that time when I was in radio, this was 72, 71, 72, right in there somewhere. Tim McCoy was traveling throughout the West with Tommy Scott's Medicine Show, which was a real low budget, low rent uh, show that worked for Kiwanis or the Lions Club or whatever. They'd book a town and come on and do this show and uh, Tommy Scott would sell his medicine like the old timers did and Tim McCoy would come out and pop the whip and so forth and what have you. And I got Tim McCoy on, on the radio for a news program and did a 30 minute interview with him, got to know Tim. And Tim told me interestingly, the only reason, he didn't need the money, my God. The only reason he did this for Tommy Scott because he could travel during the daytime. He was a Civil War buff so he could travel the south where this show was and he could visit the Civil War battle sites in the daytime and, and for history and so forth. And then he'd do the show at night and it paid and he'd go on to the next town and that's what he did. Johnny McBrown I never met. I had a, uh, I put in a phone call. He was in Dothan, Alabama where he was from. I put in a phone call and we had set up an interview. I was going over to Dothan from Columbus, Georgia to meet Johnny Mac and uh, one of my disc jockeys got sick and I had to fill in for him so I had to call Mr. Brown and say I can't make it and we just never got back together. Bob Livingston was very bitter about his career unfortunately I think. He just, it didn't go the way, he didn't really like doing the B-Westerns I don't think that, that he did. He came to a couple of film festivals when he was very old and very bitter about things and not in the best of health, which didn't help any either about his outlook on things. But he, um, I think he'd have been better off doing drawing room comedies and drawing room, you know, uh, more adult things than the B Westerns. And he and Ray Corrigan didn't see eye to eye either. Uh, Corrigan thought he should be the star and Bob really was. And um, Crash Corrigan was, uh, a great guest at film festivals. I saw him when he sat out there signing autographs for hours on end, and when he went back to his room, he pulled off his boots, and his boots were apparently too tight, but his feet were bloody from uh, maybe endema or whatever the cause was. I don't know, but I mean, he was very gracious with the fans. But on the other hand, a lady named Evelyn Finley, who was a leading lady and a stunt lady, and a lot of B-Westerns uh, told me that when you're out on location, there's a thing called a honey wagon where you go to the bathroom. On this particular film, whatever it was that Evelyn was making, there was no honey wagon. They were filming at Corriganville. So she went up to Corrigan's house, which is at Corriganville, and he owned the ranch, and he lived there. And she knocked on the door and she said, I got to go to the bathroom. There's no honey wagon. He said, I'm sorry, go out in the bushes. <laughs> and she never, you would never forget that. I mean, very rude to her. Clayton Moore, I met, I wouldn't say I knew him. Um, 
he came to one film festival. That was during the time when he couldn't wear the mask when they were forbidding him and they were making that terrible Lone Ranger movie with uh, whatever his name was. Duncan Ronaldo was, was great. Duncan Ronaldo was uh, a very gentle one. I never really knew Roy. I met Roy. I met Dale, thanks to Evelyn Finley, the stunt lady we talked about. I never really knew Roy and Dale that well. Uh, I learned a lot about Roy and Dale from from Bill Whitney and other people uh, that, that respected Roy immensely. I mean, Gene Autry, I only, I've worked with the Autry Entertainment people and Autry Museum a lot. I only, <laughs> We were at a Golden Boot Affair, I think it was. I knew Monty and Joanne Hale, and they were there. And I walked over to their table, and Monty and Joanne Hale were sitting there, and Gene and Jackie Autry were sitting next to them. I knelt down on the floor because there was no chair, and I was talking to Joanne Hale about something or another, an auction we'd been to or something. And Gene Autry was sitting next, and he was paying attention to the conversation. As it went on, he began to kind of lean in and listen. And finally, he reached over and said, I'm Gene Autry. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir, I know who you are. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Monty Hale was a very private man in, in many ways because he had some problems with his childhood and so forth. And I remember sitting with at his house, his apartment down here, and he opened up about a lot of his childhood um, problems and so forth, and tears were actually coming down, and his wife Joanne said, you ought to let Boyd write, write your book because he'll do it right. Uh, he, he, he'll respect what you have to say and not change it. And he said, yeah, maybe we ought to do that. Never did happen, unfortunately. But, uh, but Monty had some problems back in his early life. But uh, he never, Monty was, how can you say it? He was a little, little lazy as far as making movies. It, 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 he just fell into it, and he did them, and he was really, really good. But he just didn't pursue it. He could have been much bigger and gone on with a lot of character parts like he did in Giant and what have you. But he didn't have the, the fire in the belly to really do that. He just, just didn't. Eddie Dean probably had the, um, the best voice of any singing cowboy I ever, ever heard. And I think as he got older and he came to film festivals that his voice was even better than it was when he was 25 or 30 years old. Just a marvelous voice and a, a wonderful man. Dick Jones was a dear, dear friend of mine, and I knew Jock too, and uh, they were the best of friends, uh, absolutely. When they started doing The Range Rider, Jocko came to Dick and said, we're going to do all this stuff ourselves. We're not. So when we go out to a show someplace or a fair or, you know, public appearance, when the kids ask us, did you really fall off that, you know, they're going to be able to honestly say, yes, we did that. That was us. That was not some stunt double. They did it all. And uh, Dickie got hurt a couple of times, but Jocko on that show never got hurt. Never really got to know Rex Allen Sr. I know Rex Jr. very well. Rex Jr., when I was in radio in uh, Albuquerque, came to play at the Caravan Club, which is a big country music club in, in Albuquerque. And I went to pick him up at the airplane and so forth and do an interview, whatever we were going to do. And we got to talk, and he said, my brother's a disc jockey in... Uh, in Denver, but I've never done a radio show. I said, you want to do mine today? Yeah. So we, I put him on the air. He did all the talking. I ran all the, the controls, and we got to be friends, and I, we kind of lost touch with each other for years, but now he is doing, he, he and his dad have had uh, Rex Allen days in Wilcox, Arizona for, God, 100 years or so, and uh, of course his dad passed away, and Rex kept doing Rex Allen days, but he, Rex Jr. is doing the final Rex Allen days this year, 2017, in uh, in about a week, and that'll be the end of end of another era. We're 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 seeing a lot of end of eras these days, unfortunately. Mm -hmm.